In our Gospel reading today, we hear of how the Sadducees challenged Jesus and tried to outsmart him in their knowledge of the law. Now, have you ever asked a question which you thought there was no answer to and may make the answer look either pompous and incorrect or bashful in their ignorance? Well, maybe you've been on the other side of the question, trying to think something up that would sound really smart, or at least passable. I feel like this sometimes when trying to answer a lecturer at uni in person or in writing. They're so much smarter than I am with their PhDs and their published works. It's sometimes hard to remember that they're people. The question posed by the Sadducees to Jesus of who will be a woman's husband in heaven if she's married seven brothers Sounds like one of these uh-oh moments to me. I can't help but ponder why these conservative Sadducees thought that this was a good story to stump Jesus with. Not only is it so ridiculous to our ears nowadays, but as a story of the Bible, this woman, if she had been someone I knew, I would have been calling the chief inspector down at the police station and the forensic scientists in <laughs> to see how she bumped all seven of her husbands off and got away with it. <laughs> More thinking needs to be done here. If we were to look at this from a first century Middle Eastern perspective, this may have been a little extreme, but not completely dumbfounding for the average person. Therefore, seeing as though this conversation took place in a public forum, I'm supposing that many people's interest were piqued by such a question. In those days, just outside the temple, or sometimes within the synagogue itself, the law was cited and used in educated arguments for the learned of the time. Many people relished such a forum for verbal verbatim and would spend much of their free time trading stories and contesting answers, much like Facebook or Twitter online forums today, to discuss political and educated issues. The synagogue discussions were also like a local pub or sports club banter, just maybe minus the alcohol. According to the law of which they refer to in the argument put to Jesus, if a brother dies leaving a childless widow, then the next brother will marry her. This law is in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5, and I'll read it to you. It states this, If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must mar not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother, so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. <coughs> now, I find this interesting, so I'm not so sure that today we would consider our brother-in-laws as suitable candidates in marriage. <laughs> Their aim was clear, however, in trying to gain either Jesus' humiliation in failing to answer the question, or in gaining some meaningful insight into what life after death would be and whether the laws that govern us here on earth would follow on in the afterlife. Jesus' answer, the law is the same as physical possessions, which we may carry in life, which do not follow on after death. We exit this life as we entered it, perhaps surrounded by family, but inevitably alone and naked as we walk on stage and then off again at the end of the show. He uses the known story of the burning bush to back up his argument per se, as maybe I would reference a known theologian in my assignments for uni. It just makes his argument even stronger. In answering with a sound knowledge of law and scripture, he's outsmarted the Sadducees, as it states that no one dared ask him any more questions. Well, that was that. But what does this mean for us today? Many people fear death, the unknown. But is it just the unknown that we fear? Accounting for our life on earth and yet assured of our forgiveness if we take scripture as any example, and that should be our guide. But what does that mean for us? Humans always want to know more. Take Harry Potter for example. The seven books ended with the close of the adventure and people are still insisting that J.K. Rowling writes more about what happened to the characters and how they lived out their lives. Or, another example, The Lion King. The classic Disney animation which had awards for its phenomenal soundtrack, then had a sequel, and quite recently a third came into being. We just can't leave it alone. And that is exactly why some people have PhDs, or three different degrees under their belt. Knowledge becomes quite addictive. To some, death is not a daunting unknown. 
but an opportunity for further life. Peter Pan, the boy who would not grow up in J.M. Barry's popular work, said that to die would be an awfully big adventure. This is essentially what Jesus tells us in the passage he quotes from the Old Testament, where he called the Lord God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I quote, He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. Our earthly death is merely the closing chapter in a great novel of love and adventure and mystery. Not something that's to be feared or reveled in or wished for, but something that happens in time, in God's time. While I was in Jerusalem, John Stewart, our course chaplain, reminded us of this every morning when we got on the bus. He would say, we are all here together in God's time, not our own, but God's, here to see and experience and learn what God wants us to see and experience and learn, here to learn and to love at God's bequest. I somehow think that you may have been talking about more than the six days we spent together in that special place. So if we're here in God's time to see and learn and love, and that we should honour our lives to the glory of God, how do we do this? I will read you a passage from Matthew chapter 6, which happens to be one of my favourites, and tells us about honouring our time here. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Your heavenly Father knows what you need, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough worries of its own. When we do die, we look forward to equality with those already gone from the world and can live in complete love with everyone. By being completed and filled with God, as is promised in the next phase, we will have no need for marriage or law as we do on earth. The togetherness we will experience with others will be so unrecognisable that we cannot hope to fathom it from this side. I imagine that death will be the opening of the real world that God has for us. Much like the final book of the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, The Last Battle, which ends with the character's death and the death of Narnia. Then they find themselves in the real Narnia, which is brighter and more vibrant than the one that they knew while still alive. The fruit tasted sweeter and they never grew tired as they ran over the green fields. That which they learnt in the pale imitation of the real Narnia was still with them as they embraced life in death. And so, we should not fear death, but the time that we waste every day in missed opportunities for kindness. Every time we miss the chance to smile with someone is wasted. By living as Christians, following after the love of Jesus Christ, we will share ourselves with one another in community while here on earth, until it is time for us to go to that other ultimate community of heaven. So, let's get to work. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, sustainer and redeemer of all. Amen. Amen. Amen.